Um, my history of commerce, I've been here about five years. Um, I started as an enforcement supervisor, and then I was over our licensing department, which also handled some AMC licensing and appraiser licensing. And now I'm back um, in this enforcement spot. I'm also the commissioner's designee on the board. So that is who I am. Um, so I'm just going to, um, I'll just call on you and then you can introduce yourself. So Peter, do you want to, Peter Brickwitty? Sure, I'm Peter Brickwitty, assistant commissioner at the Commerce Department. Peter Bratch. I'm Pete Bratch, licensing director here at Commerce. Nisa. Hi, I'm Nisa, I'm an admin for the enforcement team. All right, Dave. Dave Turner, I'm the AMC representative on the advisory board. Patrick. Patrick Lambert, I'm the residential appraiser. Uh, All right, Adam. Adam Schmidt, I am the certified general representative on the board. And then we have our, the ASC is here, so um, Neil, do you want to go first? <laughs> uh, my name is Neil Fenichetti. I'm here uh, from the appraisal subcommittee. I'm a policy manager, and we're here for our regularly scheduled biennial compliance review. Christy Klamet, I'm also a policy manager, um, assisting Neil with the compliance review. And I'm Tom Lewis, I'm a policy manager as well. All right, so thank you. Um, uh, Terry or Byron, if you're on the call, can you raise your hand? Um, and then we'll, we'll get you to introduce yourself as well. We have two other board members. I believe they may be calling in. Um, but I'm just going to go over some of the ground rules for these meetings. Just generally, um, all our meetings are open to the public. Uh, we meet quarterly. Um, this is our first meeting of 2023, which also means we need to elect a board chair, uh, which we currently don't have a chair, and that's normally who runs the meetings. Um, so until we ha that happens, I'll run the I'll run the meeting. Um, and you know the rules. You know, just treat each other with, <coughs> with respect. We're going to stay within our scope of work. Um, you know, we want the pur the purpose of the board is to you know give us feedback on you know industries and trends um, in the industry that we should be aware of that commerce should be aware of, um, in the sense that we're not necessarily we're not a full power board, so we're not we're different than most states so uh, that power, do licensing and full power board. board. Full power. That's is it what, technical. That, that's my that's technical term. term. Okay, gotcha. Um, so you okay. know we don't you know the board doesn't make enforcement decisions or licensing decisions or anything like that. It's all done by commerce. This is the advisory board to provide advice to commerce. Um, so just a couple of ground rules. We're going to, you know, if you, at the end of the meeting, we do have a time for public comments. If there's somebody on the phone who wants to speak, I ask that you raise your hand in the team's chat and then we will get there. Uh, we'll, we'll call you out um, and you can speak at the end. Um, and then in the room, we do have an agenda. Um, I know Peter Brickwoody has to leave a little bit early, so we might skip around a little bit, but um, generally speaking, that is sort of the operation of the board. Um, like I said, the first thing we need to do is elect a board chair. So that means that, um, do we have nominations of board members who want to be chair? Dave, you've got some experience in the room. I mean, how, I, I'm not sure how this worked in the past or what, what exactly the board's role is. I wanted to nominate Byron since he's not here. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm not sure if that's appropriate. Um, well, typically, um, I, when we've done this before, we just take the nominations, and if there's more than one person, they give a little spiel about why it would be a good chair, why it would not be a good chair. Um, unfortunately, we don't have two people, two of our board members here, so we're sort of down a man, um, and the commitment to be a chair is only the, for the first year. So we do an election every, um, the beginning of every year. So this would only be for the remaining meetings in 2023, and then in 2024, we elect hey. somebody new. Byron's on. I nominate Byron. Byron. The chair of the, of the advisory board. Byron, do you want to introduce yourself? Yeah. Sure, I'm muted. Nope, you're, we can hear you. Oh, okay, cool. Thank you, everyone. I'm Byron Miller. Um, I'm a residential appraiser in Minnesota, Wisconsin. I apologize for being late. I was on another uh, webinar panel call thing. Um, been, in, uh, been involved with uh, the board since its inception and actually one of the uh, 
people that wrote the legislation along with Jackie that uh, reconstituted the board back in 2018. Um, and happy to be here. Good to see your faces. Sorry I couldn't make it. Um, you'll see me in person next time. I did um, forget, um, Ezekiel, are you on the phone call? I don't know if I- Yes, I'm on board. Okay, great. Can you introduce yourself to the board as well? Uh, my name is Ezekiel Agbosu. I'm uh, new to the appraisal. Uh, I currently work as a real estate specialist uh, for Canadian Pacific Railroad, and I'm taking some courses uh, for appraisal. So I'm interested in learning more and also uh, get involved. Thank you, I apologize if I missed you before. Um, I'm just gonna do one more call. Terry, are you on the phone? Terry Jensen? She wasn't sure if she could make it. Um, okay, so picking up where we left off, Byron, you've been nominated to be the chair of the board. Are there any other nominations for the chair? Hearing none, Byron, it looks like you are the chair of the board. <laughs> is this kind of like Gomer Pyle, you know, where everybody takes a step back and I was too dumb not to take a step back too? <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you. Uh, so yeah, like you, like Byron said, he's been on the board since its inception. Um, and so he's been fairly active and um, I know he'll be a great chair for the board. Um, normally, I would turn the meeting over to you, Byron, but for ease, do you want me to just run through the agenda or how, how would you like me to do it? Sure. For this one, yeah, you can run through the agenda. I've actually reviewed all the material, but uh, I have to admit that I just came off another call, so I don't have it in front of me, although I do have questions for you when the time comes. So sure, take it away, Jack. Okay. All right. All right. So uh, let it be known that Byron is now the, the board of the, the chair of the board. So going forward, he, Byron will be the one who's going to be in charge of putting the agenda together, emailing the board members about um, agenda items and everything, and running the meeting. So that's where we're going to go from here. But as of today, I'll just I'll just do it myself um, and do the best I can as. Um, so the first order of business on the agenda <clears throat> after the election is the approval of the minutes. Um, I know I emailed around the, our minutes from our October 20 or October 6, 2022 meeting. Um, so if you guys have a chance to review them, I think I need a, um, a motion to approve the minutes. Um, so moved, Dave. All right, is there a second? I, I do have a question. I don't remember recall seeing the minutes in the packet. Um, that was sent out. So everybody else got it? Yep. Yep, it was on the email. From October, where, yeah. October 6th, right? Yep. yep. It was on the email I sent to the board um, with all the materials. There was a lot of attachments. Yeah, I must have missed that. Okay. Do we have a second? I'll second it. Second two. Second two. Second two. Um, all right. So um, the first order of business that so we typically do in these meetings, and we, we commerce does their reports um, for every sort of area of commerce that is um, responsible for a portion of the regulation of appraisers and AMCs. Um, so the first one is our uh, continuing education report, um, which was circulated. And uh, as of February 10th, it said that no appraiser related CE courses were denied um, during the last quarter. Does anyone have questions about that. Excellent. Um, the next one is um, our enforcement actions. So between September 24th, 2022 and February 13th, 2023, uh, we reached settlements with seven appraisers um, and the list of those appraisers were on the memo. Um, I don't want to mispronounce them, but uh, Maureen Jungers, Jerry Weber, Jerome Weber, Thomas Griffith, Michael Nuring, Christian Bloomquist, and Lavertis Isaac. Um, and along with that report, the consent orders were also circulated to everybody. Um, so does anyone have questions about that? Um, I do have a question. As I read through all of them, 
and I know this has come up at other board meetings, um, is there some type of, um, I know that you have talked about it orally, but is there some type of consistent methodology? Because it seems as though, you know, some of the penalties, uh, frankly, seem minor, and given the dollar amounts they're being penalized, and then other ones are, you know, right in, right along those lines. So I was just kind of wondering again, is there um, some type of methodology that you could, and I know you talked about this before, maybe you could go over it again with the new folks to talk about the metrics that you use when you're uh, reviewing these, um, um, you know, these uh, complaints, if you would, please. Um, sure. Um, yeah, we, we've talked about this at other board meetings. Um, the, the, the way we look at um, enforcement actions is we're driven by our statute, which whose number I can't recall, 45 dot something, 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 um, which I think I've shared with everyone before that gives sort of the um, the criteria of, of what we do and how we review them and how we look at complaints. Um, so that's sort of the guiding principle. Um, Matt Boyer, are you on the phone? Do you want to talk a little bit more about this? He's the enforcement supervisor. Yes, so I'd be happy to. Can everyone hear me OK? Uh, thumbs up will do fine. Excellent, thank you. Um, so the. Uh, Can you introduce yourself too? Oh yeah, so Matt Boyer, Minnesota Department of Commerce. I supervise the team that handles uh, investigations uh, into uh, a number of different industries. So uh, appraisers is one of them. Also mortgage companies, uh, servicers, originators, lenders, um, and then real estate brokerages, real estate uh, salespersons and brokers, and then also title companies. Uh, so that's uh, that's the uh, kind of the book of business or parties that uh, that we work with. Um, and uh, yep, for the group, the uh, the primary guidance on these out uh, that we get or that we're given statutorily, it's uh, 14.045 is the statute, specifically subdivision three. And uh, so that in there, the guidance in there is uh, much like uh, any common sense that you might uh, suspect that it is uh, um, harm that uh, the person's actions caused um, uh, an improper benefit that the person received, um, the number of times something has happened, um, if there's been prior actions against the, the person, um, and there, there's about five, six different things. And then at the end, there's a, a catch all that uh, says uh, other factors as justice may require. So that's uh, that's what that is. Thanks, Matt. Thank you. You're welcome. Mm -hmm. um, anything else, Byron? Not with regards to that. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Thanks. I, I have a question on the education. Um, and, and part of this probably is me sh should have a better understanding of, of where this is at. But you know, there was a period of time where new online courses weren't being approved post COVID. Is is that that's now we're now able to approve new um, digital or online courses. Is that correct? Yeah, I don't I don't recall that we were ever not approving them, but yeah, they're certainly able to be submitted now. Because we had, um, you know, I, I, I take a lot of education through the American Society of Farm Managers and post COVID, any new seminars that were developed for virtual instruction were not being improved, uh, approved by the state. Uh, my understanding that is now the case, but there was a period of time where Minnesota was about the only state that wasn't approving virtual instruction of any new courses. That's not what that's not what we were doing. I think in this particular case, there may have been classroom courses that we were asked to allow online credit for, but we would have needed a separate application for that if I'm understanding the situation. We we weren't ever in a position where we were just outright not approving courses. Okay. Um, yeah, whatever, have to, whatever it was, it wouldn't be the case now. Okay. I'd have to dig into that a little bit more to um, provide examples, but um, it sounds like, you know, new virtual instruction courses or seminars or whatever you want to call it would, you know, that doesn't present any problems. Yeah, if the, the application is filled out with everything we need, okay. then, and it's an eligible topic, sure. Okay, thank you. All 
Right. But if there are examples, Adam, that you want to go back to, you know, feel free to bring those to our attention and then we can talk more specifically because our statutes are pretty specific with <laughs> things that we do. So and, you know, understanding that part of it is, is part of. Well, and, you know, COVID, maybe that's a good thing. COVID seems like it was a while ago um, and it was just crazy times. Right. Um, but there was definitely some frustrations during those periods. And, and just, you know, the main thing is hopefully we're past all those. And, and, you know, forward. So, thank you. Thank you. Um, all right, the next, um, so licensing uh, provided our statistics for the active licensing, um, active appraisers for AMCs um, and appraisers as well. Um, that was also included in everything that was sent out. Um, we also just want to note that between September 23rd, 2022 and February 13th, 2023, there were three applications for license upgrade and they were all approved. So that is sort of the licensing report. Um, do you guys have questions about the report or licensing or continuing ed that you haven't asked yet? I have a question, yeah. real quick. Thanks, Cherokee. Just want to make sure I understand for the year 2023, probably for Peter. Um, those those numbers will then be updated. I think if I remember correctly, those numbers that 2023 line will be updated throughout the year. Um, as renewals come in on the active appraiser on the second page uh sure yeah so the second page is a snapshot of each year on january 1st so those numbers will not change the updated numbers will be on the first page in the first chart the very beginning okay and that is as of february 10th yes so okay so i'll do the do the math. Here. I remember to remember not to include temps because right. temps aren't included on the second page. Right. Okay. So if I'm reading this correctly, you're saying that from January 1 to now, there are three less licensed residential. There's um, certified residential went from 893 to 773. Oh, actually, no, because that includes number one, 892. That went down by one and then certified general uh, went from 777 to 785. There's been an uptick. Okay. I only bring that up because I was curious. Just I wanted to point out for the, for the board um, some interesting kind of statistics as, right? So part of the reason we have these metrics is to understand fluctuations in licensing, both for appraisers and AMCs, to see how those have been changing over the years. Um, one of the ways that I've been reconciling that data is looking at other, like appraiser capacity data, to anticipate whether we're going to have a spike upward or downward of appraiser renewals. Uh, one of the ways that that we've tracked it as AMCs, but right, appraisers are privy to this information, I'm sure Byron's seen it, is that um, Freddie Mac in particular publishes appraisal volume so how much appraisal volume is going through the UCDP, which is the uniform collateral data portal it's where all the appraisals go through for loans that are purchased by the GSEs. And they compare volume versus number of unique licenses that are performing the appraisal work. So as you can imagine, right, typically there's high points and lower points, a lot more volume in the summer, less in the fall, and appraiser licenses kind of stay static. In 2021, 22, right, volume was very high, the licensing number was also fairly static of unique licenses uh, performing that work. As you can, right, as we all know, in about May 2022, the mortgage market goes down, and so the UCDP the data reflected a downward you know, trend in volume. What's interesting is that the number of unique licenses performing work has actually gone down 10,000, from 40,000 to 30,000. Um, that doesn't ha that did not happen in previous years when there were drops in the market, right? And the normal kind of cadence of the mortgage market as it fluctuates up and down. So that'll be interesting just to monitor for the state as they see renewals change and whether that will ref whether in Minnesota we're going to see kind of this data being reflected in our licensing numbers or if there's some other reasons or explanations as to why this is occurring. So that was just some background. I thought it was interesting. Well, this, was data, this data just came out. I'm happy to share the link. Uh, Freddie Mac, I believe, publishes this capacity chart monthly. So I'm happy to share that that link with the with the board. It's pretty interesting just to see how how it's changing. 
Yeah, if you could email the board yeah, with happy to do it. Yeah. Um, just a comment on that, Dave. You know, technology is playing a big part of of in the lending world for appraisals, anyways. You know, with the plur proliferation of um, ABMs and such. Yeah. Um, you know, maybe that those spikes are handled by technology more than people in certain cases. Um, but it will be interesting to this downturn now if if we have more people exit the industry. Right. I do have a question. It's probably as consistent with or um, kind of a springboard off of what you were uh, talking about, uh, Dave. Um, I noticed that there's, you know, you have the active license on page one. You've got a total of what looks like 2173 on my little screen here. Yep. And then you've got the, and then you got the total appraisers. Uh, under the act of appraisers, and I know you kind of talked about that. You asked that question, Dave, which one of those is um, captured on January 1st. Um, and then what is this other number? For instance, the first one on page one, this is 2173. Is that for the year or is that for the um, on 831 of that year? Um, because I noticed the two numbers are are different, and I was just quite wasn't quite catching how they um, co uh, how they correlate, if you would. Oh, so Byron, this is Pete. Hey Pete. Two two reasons they differ. The main one is because temporary appraisers are included on chart on page one, and they're not on the numbers on page two. So there's 161 temps that are reflected in. The numbers on page one that are not part of the numbers on page two and also the numbers on page two are from january 1st and the numbers on page one are more recent they're from february 10th okay i think we ask this question every year <laughs> in january <laughs> the refresher for everyone yeah i think yes. we do yeah so it's a, it, the first page captures a moment in time as of february 10th which is what will be updated next meeting when we have our next quarterly meeting then pete sends up the updated numbers as of that date so those are going to be a little bit different but this is the first page is a snapshot in time and the other one is as of january 1st hopefully that okay. does that answer your question byron yes it does thank you thank you byron jackie Go ahead. byron would there be a, a more user-friendly way for me to present the temporary numbers would you want them separated from this or yeah that would be useful because then that would yeah. probably eliminate some of the confusion so then every year we wouldn't be asking the same question because then you could just do the math and add them you got it i'll make that change for next time. thank you all right um did you want to ask your question patrick I, you were trying to allude to the numbers did you have a question about the numbers no on the first page no okay um all right any other questions about amc licensing stats it looked like there was a question in the chat. Is there a question in the chat? Uh, all the, um, yeah. What do you need to submit to prove you've taken the coursework and have a college degree? Well, we would need to see the course completion certificates and the diploma right unless the provider of the education had uploaded the course completions so i'm not aware that we have an education verification form it's part of the application process yeah there's a link in there that's in front yeah okay then that's the one that's experience though the questions about education If you have other questions about that, feel free to, to add them in the chat and we'll get back to that um, as well. Um, all right, so next I'm gonna go to Peter Brickwitty um, for a legislative update from Commerce Perspective. Hi everybody. Um, so the department is not bringing forward any, uh, any appraiser related legislation this session uh, and nor have I seen any introduced um, so far this year by uh, independent actors. So. Uh, at the moment, um, it's going to be a very short report. I, I will do want to take a, just a second to note something that's not specifically um, 
related to appraisers, but is something that's being carried in the governor's budget. Um, and may at some later point be a topic of discussion, uh, maybe if it were to pass up, so maybe something for the summer or the fall meetings. So uh, Commerce is carrying a proposal called Strengthen Minnesota Homes, which is modeled after a program that exists in several Gulf Coast states that provides uh, grant funding for residents to upgrade and strengthen the uh, exterior home envelope of their roofs and, and siding against uh, climate-driven perils that, uh, that are facing that, that particular state. So here in Minnesota, we'd be focused at high winds and hail. Um, we're excited about this program. It fits into the administration's uh, climate action framework really neatly. And I, I won't spend a ton of time going into the details about why we're, we're bringing that program forward, but the reason why I'm mentioning it here is that one of the features of the program um, is that there's an independent third-party verification that the work that's performed by a contractor on a home has been done to a technical standard, um, which is developed by a research organization called the Insurance Institute for Business and Home Safety, Safety or IBHS. And it relies on this network of third-party evaluators to do that third-party verification. And that's one of the ways where other states that have programs like this have avoided disputes between insurance companies and contractors where, uh, because there's a third party validation that the work has been done to the technical standard. Um, we've worked uh, uh, along with, um, uh, with uh, um, other folks in, uh, on the call, but in different capacities from their board capacity on legislative proposals to provide exemptions to use path for appraisers to perform valuation uh, type work that is not necessarily in line with, uh, with full use path. And this may be something where I think the skill set for residential appraisers may translate well uh, as an opportunity to potentially do these evaluations. So this is a longer term kind of effort. I just wanted to tee it up here. We still have a lot of work to do to actually pass this into law this year. Um, we have a two year runway to stand up the program and establish it before we would actually be uh, starting projects in the state. But I wanted to mention it, um, and if anyone is interested in learning more, I'd be happy to chat with them. But Jackie, it may be something we try to do back later this year for a more detailed conversation. Yes, love that, Peter. I'd love to talk to you about it and see how we can uh, tee that up and possibly uh, bring some appraisers into the fold on that, if possible. Thanks, Byron. Does anyone have anything else? Uh, questions about legislation or any comments about what's going on in the legislature? Anything? No? Okay. Um, so then we'll move our, over to our new business. Um, so obviously the appraisal subcommittee is here. Um, they're here for their um, audit of commerce and its appraiser and AMC programs, um, which typically has happens every two years, but COVID sort of <coughs> did a bit, um, but they are back um, this year. So I am going to turn it over to you guys if you want to talk a little bit about what you're doing and and, uh, and such. Sure, Tom, I'll take care of that. Thank you, Tom. Um, good afternoon, everybody. I hope everyone can hear me. Uh, my name is Tom Lewis. I am a policy manager with the appraisal subcommittee. I am the newest policy manager with the appraisal subcommittee. In fact, if you look at the uh, annual report and go down the list of staff, at the very bottom it says vacant policy manager. <laughs> so I will answer to Tom or vacant, whatever <laughs> is most convenient for you guys. Um, but it is, it's, a, it's an honor to be here with you today. Um, and uh, as you can tell, I'm not from Minnesota. I'm from North Carolina and um, I hope that you don't need a translator to understand what I'm saying. But um, I also happen to be a certified general appraiser and a former state regulator from North Carolina, where I was the uh, deputy director and chief investigator for about 17 years. So I have a little bit of an idea of, of what the faces the Department of Commerce here. And, you know, up front, I want to thank the staff for being very accommodating to us and, and, and cooperating with us as we're here to do this. Compliance review. One of the things I wanted to talk about just briefly is give you kind of an overview of what the ASC does and how we mesh with the other entities that kind of form the um, appraisal regulatory uh, 
framework. So uh, the appraisal subcommittee of the federal, and I am going to read y'all for a little bit. I'm going to have to read from this because I have not been here long enough to memorize all this, so bear with me. The appraisal subcommittee of the Federal Financial Institution Examination Council was created in 1989 under Title 11 of the Financial Institutions Reform, Recovery, and Enforcement Act of 1989. And this part is important. FIREA was established to ensure that federal financial and public policy interests in real estate transactions are protected by requiring that real estate appraisals utilized in connection with federally related transactions are performed in writing following uniform standards and by those whose competency has been demonstrated and whose professional conduct will be the subject of effective supervision. And essentially that sentence forms the, the regulatory framework because it talks about the requirement to ensure. That's where the appraisal subcommittee comes in as being um, an overwatch or, or um, I guess overwatch would be a better word. And then it talks about the um, appraisals that are uh, performed in writing following uniform standards by those whose competency has been demonstrated, whose professional conduct. Um, that what's, that's the part that brings in the appraisal foundation, which is a non-government entity that was established by Congress to uh, essentially uh, create the standards and the requirements for those entering the appraisal field. And then where it says, in whose professional conduct will be subject to effective supervision, that's where the state regulators come in. You guys are the, where the rubber meets the road and we're heavily dependent upon you and, and the job that you perform. The ASC is represented by several, correction, seven federal uh, banking representatives. And those are the Federal Reserve Board, the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation, the Federal Housing Finance Agency, the Office of the Comptroller of the Currency, the National Credit Union Association, Housing and Urban Development, and uh, Consumer Finance Protection Bureau. Um, these are our member agencies. Each one of the member agencies has a designate that sits on the board and reviews the work of the subcommittee staff, which is, is where we fall into play. Um, Title 11 requires ASC to monitor the requirements established by the states. Uh, it also requires us to monitor the requirements established by the federal financial institution regulatory agencies maintain the national registry of state certified and licensed appraisers and also a registry of amcs uh, establish and operate an appraisal complaint national hotline including a total three number monitor and review the practices and procedures of activities of the organizational structure of the appraisal foundation trans transmit an annual report to congress Make grants to the foundation to help defray the costs relating to the activities of the Appraisal Standard Board, the ASB, and the Appraiser Qualifications Board, the AQB, and make grants to state appraiser certifying license, licensing agencies to support the efforts of the states to comply with Title 11, including the complaint process, complaint investigations, appraiser enforcement activities, the submission of data on the state licensed and certified appraisers and AMCs to the Appraiser National Registry, the AMC Registry and reporting all state appraisers certifying the licensing agencies when a license or a certification is surrendered, both are suspended. Um, during the compliance review and while we're here over the next few days, we're going to be focusing on a few things. And this not only goes for our examination of your appraiser program, but also of your appraisal management program. Um, we're going to focus on your statutes and regulations. We're going to look at temporary practice. Of course, the National Registry of Appraisers and the AMCs. We're going to look at your application process, making sure that you have those systems in place to make sure that your uh, application process is equitable, consistent, fair. Um, we're also going to look at education, making sure that the education that you accept for qualifying and continuing education is uh, AQB approved and appropriate. And then we're going to uh, look at um, your process for reciprocity and then education again and then finally enforcement and, and most in particular where enforcement is concerned we want to make sure that your enforcement programs not only for your appraisal program but for your management your appraisal management program is uh, timely it's equitable um, and well documented and consistent and that more or less in a nutshell is is what we're going to be doing while we're here 
on the conclusion of our examination of the records, and that's primarily why we're on site today, is to look at your records to actually examine the documents. Um, as Jackie alluded to earlier, um, in previous reviews uh, here lately, because of COVID, we weren't actually able to go out and do an on-site examination. Um, now that that has changed, we are here, and it's important, we feel like, to come out and actually look at the documents and, of course, talk to the staff. Um, once we are finished with the examination, there will be a uh, preliminary report, and then um, we'll follow through with that later with your, your state agency. But that is it uh, in a nutshell. Again, I want to thank you for allowing us to be here. We really appreciate all the support. I want to say uh, congratulations to the chairman on your election, obviously, and uh, for the any new members that are here and participating. Uh, welcome to the world of appraiser and appraiser management regulatory practice. Um, I don't know, you probably, you might not often hear from licensees, they might not thank you, but as a licensee, I will thank you for dedicating the time to do this. I know there's probably other things you could be doing, but it's very much appreciated by the staff of the subcommittee. So thank you very much. And thank you for letting me have this talk. Thank you, Tom. Um, does anyone have any questions for the ASB over here? I do. Yeah. So, okay. Um, full disclosure, Tom, um, I am a, a member of the AQB, so I'm putting on my AQB hat for a second. Um, you talked about one of the things that you do is that you look at things from uh, compliance for the AQB. Could you? Kind of give me a quick summary. Is this with relation to the RPAQC or other things? Well, yes, sir. In in general, um, we want to make sure that the states are are following the criteria uh, with regard to the real property appraiser criteria, and then also looking at their education continuing and qualifying education, also to make sure it's AQB compliant. Um, I'm not really sure what else I could tell you beyond that. Is there is there something specific? No. I'm, okay. No, no, you're the new guy. You know, uh, <laughs> when I was when I was new on the board, I always referred to myself as the red shirt from Star Trek. Remember that? If, for those of you that are old enough, right. uh, the red shirt was the guy. He you never saw him before. He showed up for five minutes and was killed quickly. So, I don't like your I don't like your analogy. I got to be honest with you. That does not <laughs> sound good. <laughs> well, I'm not getting any dirty looks from across the table, so I must have done okay. So okay, that's very good. That's very good. So uh, no, I was just curious with regards to uh, getting an overview. Uh, you also mentioned something with regards to um, uh, reciprocity. Could you kind of expand on that a little bit, please? Sure. Um, the, the preference is, of course, is that every state has a process for reciprocity, that they um, are not putting barriers or excessive fees or anything like that that would prevent a licensee from practicing in another jurisdiction. Um, we want to encourage um, all of the states to have a, a process for reciprocity. Yeah, if I could just add, Title, Title 11 specifically addresses reciprocity. Um, and states are required to have a reciprocal policy that provides for the issuance of a credential to an applicant coming from another state that holds a current credential, and the other state is compliant with Title 11 as uh, determined by the appraisal subcommittee, um, and that other state's uh, requirements for credentialing either meet or exceed, in this case, the state of uh, Minnesota's requirements. Oh, okay, thank you. Anything else, Byron, or did that answer your question? It did, and then some. Thank you. Uh, the only other thing I'd like to add is that the, uh, the, the, the documents that we use to determine compliance are essentially Title 11, uh, which is in our annual report, uh, our policy statements. We have uh, four for appraisal management companies uh, seven for uh, appraisers, and then one for interim sanctions, and the AMC rule. Uh, those are the documents that really direct how your program can stay compliant with the requirements for appraisers and AMCs. Uh, maybe you could also kind of explain mm -hmm. to the folks out there about your rating system and 
um, cause I was just on the AMC site and I saw that our 2018, um, audit showed up that we were good as far as compliance. So maybe uh-huh. you could. Sure. We have five ratings that go from excellent down to poor. Uh, the lowest rating of course is poor and, um, poor would be, uh, the rating a state would have to have in order for you to, in order for a state to refuse reciprocity. Uh, so poor would be the only rating that indicates non-compliance with Title 11. It goes um, from poor up to, I know there are only five ratings, but. <clears throat> Which again is in our annual report. How far back is it? Okay, so it's it goes uh, starting at the lowest of poor uh, to uh, not satisfactory to needs improvement to good to excellent, and those ratings determine basically how often you'll see us as a state. Uh, our typical compliance review cycle is two years. Um, so excellent and good would see two years. Needs improvement would see a two-year review with probably some po- follow-up or off-site monitoring, and then it, uh, not satisfactory. Then you're moving to a one-year compliance review, and poor, you're probably going to see us every six months. Okay. Very good. And how soon, when you're done with your audit, do, do the folks at Commerce get to see the results? We'll provide a preliminary report within, I'd say, six weeks uh, and this give the opportunity, uh, give the states the opportunity to respond uh, to the preliminary report, um, 60 days. And so after we receive a response or at the expiration of the 60 days, we submit um, our draft report to the subcommittee, which uh, will include if there was a response, uh, any uh, response to the items that were on the preliminary report, which may which may change our uh, perception of how uh, the level of risk of that particular item. So you might go from something that initially is non-compliant in the preliminary, but the state's able to respond with documentation and would could move it to an area of concern rather than non-compliance. So once that 60 day period expires or we get the response, it goes to the subcommittee and they make a final determination on the report and the rating. The rating will be included in the final report. The preliminary report is a staff to staff document that's not public. And the final report is uh, public and posted on our website the day that it's uh, given to the states with the final rating and the final issues of compliance or concern. And, it's typically- and that, happens, that, that would happen within like, I'd say six or eight weeks of uh, the expiration of the 60 day period. Sure. And then just to, for clarification, yeah. you also look at AMCs as well as uh, just real property appraisers as well. Yeah, we just started with the compliance reviews on the AMC programs. We had done, I think, two and then COVID hit. So we had to suspend that. Um, we did what was called uh, off-site assessments um, where we didn't look at any actual documentation and file. So it was kind of a general overview of the uh, program just to ensure that uh, if states needed assistance in, in maintaining compliance or if we could just offer any assistance in helping them to uh, attain or, or remain compliant with Title 11. That was our biggest concern throughout COVID. But we. We didn't want to put the states in a position where they would get a new rating during that time. So uh, we were not issuing new ratings with the off-state assessments. So is your criteria a little different? I'm sorry. They're two separate reports. Yeah, and they're two, two so the AMC is a separate report. And then, so I know that for instance, with, you know, uh, with the, when you're looking at appraisal stuff, it's, for instance, the AQB component, you look at the RPAQC, are you looking at some other criteria to benchmark for AMCs, like under Title 11? AMC, we only have three areas that we look at. 
-hmm. under Title 11. It's not the seven areas like it is on the appraiser side. So we really look to the to ensure that the uh, AMCs are properly qualified to be included on the National Registry, that the complaints are being resolved in the same manner as, as required on the appraiser side. Um, and obviously that the National Registry data is submitted and reconciled and uh, discipline is reported. So Thank those you. are the three general areas. Thank you. I appreciate you uh, responding to my wonky questions. <laughs> uh, any other questions for that part of it? All right. So um, any other new business from the board members? Are, is there anything that any board member wants to bring the attention? the board for discussion or follow up. Okay, there's none in the room. Byron or Ezekiel, do you guys have anything? No. For your business? Okay. No. All right. All right. Thank you. Um, so then uh, next on the agenda is old business um, and that's the I put the changes to the ECRV form, as I re recall, in October. I think Byron, you and Terry were going to maybe partner together to draft a letter um, to um, Revenue about um, kind of reconsidering the decision on the changing the ECRV form. So I just want to put that on there. I wasn't sure if you and Terry had an opportunity to connect on that. Uh, yes, actually, we did connect. Um... I'll have to circle back. She's not on the call, is she? I don't think so, no. Okay, yeah, because um, we'll have to regroup because actually we did, or I actually looked into uh, some uh, legislative remedies for that particular issue and ran it up the flag poll, poll with several legislators and various a couple of other organizations, and there was no appetite for that. So um we would have to kind of regroup and circle back and see if she wants to uh, how she wants to proceed on that this is kind of her um you know this is kind of her issue. what were the what were the changes being suggested or considered uh she wanted to put a couple of fields in that would make it easier for ver uh, verification um so <clears throat> it's already information, you know, once I dug into it a little deeper, I found that that information is already available and it's just that you have to go through a couple of extra steps. And that was uh, primarily why um, several legislators that I talked to said they had no interest in it because they're saying, OK, well, just it's not preventing verification. It's just making it more convenient. Got it. Thanks, Byron. Mm -hmm. um, does anyone, any other board members have any other old business? I didn't have anything else on the agenda, but I wasn't sure if there was anything we needed to talk about again. Specifically, Dave and Byron, since you guys are the only old board members on here now. Got it. All right. Um, so uh, now I guess, you know, is our time for public comments. I don't know if there's any members of the public that wanted to ask a question or address the board in any way. Um, if you do, um, can you please raise your hand on the Teams chat or you can ask your question in the chat and we can address it as best we can. All right. Uh, seeing none, uh, we'll still be here if you change your mind. So feel free to raise your hand um, if something comes to mind. Um, we do need to set the future board meeting schedule and locations. I think in the past we've um, done a, a doodle poll about availability. So the next one would be approximately in three months from now. So what is that? June? Um, were there? End of May, end of, end of May, beginning of June. Um, and I now I need to is going to help me with uh, the admin stuff on the board so I can make sure I can send out that if that is the easiest for people on some dates as to what's available or does anyone want to talk about it uh, right now? Yeah, I think that um, 
maybe we could um, like, you know, you and I, Jackie can dialogue and then we'll send out a doodle poll of some dates so then we can make sure we get uh, buy in. And then from there, um, once we get that set, then we'll set up the uh, other ones for the rest of the year as well. And then do you guys, does the board have opinions on where those meetings are held? I mean, they're going to be hybrid, hybrid meetings is, is always the goal. So um, I know in October we met in Rochester um, and at a hybrid location, but I wasn't sure if board members have any opinion on it. I know we've met in St. Paul a couple times. Um, yeah, me personally, and I can't speak for the board, I think it's important for us to continue to rotate uh, because there are those, you know, outside the metro area to give folks an opportunity to come see us in action if they want to. So, you know, that's, I think that, you know, there's a little hybrid is okay, but, you know, it's really not the same here sitting in my room <laughs> than being at the table with you folks. Okay. So that's just my opinion from an old guy. Do you guys have ideas on where that is? I don't have any opinions on the matter, so I don't, I'm not going to offer any <laughs> ideas well, on location. I'm, I'm flexible. I don't have any necessarily uh, suggestions, um, but I'm certainly flexible. Um, yeah, and historically what we've done is we tried to go into other areas. Like I think we had it in Brainerd. We had it, uh, did we do Owatonna yet? No. Um, you know, kind of like St. Cloud, Owatonna, Austin, Duluth. You know, we talk about doing that because there's, you know, we have 2,100 appraisers in the state. And, you know, there are many of them that would really like to come and participate if they were aware of it. So, um, and we typically have, we've, we've been doing two in, you know, in the metro area. And then two, we rotate two outstate. So, I mean, outside the metro area. So our next one would probably be outside the metro area in May, seeing that we did this one. So any ideas where? I'm just trying to narrow it down to try to figure out what our facilities are. Oh yeah, we need a facility. Um, yeah, because I mean, we in Rochester, when we, when we went to Rochester, I know we used um, the DOC's. The facility, wasn't it? Yep, and then we went to Detroit Lakes, which I can't even remember where that we actually used uh, the public I remember I was sick. Like, I remember that. That's what I remember yeah. from that board meeting. Um, <laughs> but so do you have like an area? Ezekiel, I see you have your hand up. Do you want to go ahead and speak or unmute yourself? Yeah, um, uh, hearing Byron talking about historical uh, locations, it just occurred to me that uh, it would be great to continue in, in that line. But at the same time, if uh, uh, the Department of Commerce can help to bring um, a geographical location of each licensed appraiser. We can see where they are most located to kind of uh, go around and you know give a priority based on the numbers. You see, to, uh, I, I mean, if there is only one appraiser, <laughs> I just give a your example in Minneapolis. We can, you know, strategize. So, okay, let's focus in Minneapolis to see if we can get him involved or get other people also involved. Or if there's a mall in Duluth, we can, you know, say, okay, let's go there and also engage those people involved. Also, be kind of get them engaged. I'm um, looking at the. Uh, I mean, I'm looking at the number of our prisoners that are registered. It seems like the number decreased from 2008 to 2023 dramatically so i don't know what's the strategy but that's just a suggestion i i got based on those two i have another Great suggestion yeah i have another byron suggestion do we have any um do we know of any upcoming or sometime in may any in-person appraiser continuing ed that we could maybe bolt on a meeting before or near that continuing education um i can find out not sure. I'm sure we can okay. find out. I know that the Appraisal Institute is uh, scheming about uh, continuing ed, um, but uh, well, let's... as they scheme uh, for providing continuing ed, another option might be, and uh, we, we have rotated locations. We've had some success, but in other times we've met, we've had no like outside visitors. So one idea is, is if, if the Appraisal Institute or others are going to apply for any in-person continuing ed, 
to maybe coordinate that with our our meeting time so that it's around the right before or after might attract more um, participation. Okay. Sure, yeah. sure, that would be a good one. Um, and what Ezekiel was talking about, that's a great suggestion. Jackie, do you have any, have you created a heat map of appraisers in, uh, in Minnesota? Because I think that's what he's alluding to. Um, I think he's working on that as we speak. Um, <laughs> heat map button. Where's, where's, my, where's my easy button? Uh, yeah, no, I, I, I agree. And I mean, I know, I'm just trying to think in terms of just ideas that I think um, maybe Byron, you and I can maybe just figure out like if, if there's a continuing ed thing we can spring off of. Uh, but as far as locations, I know we haven't been to like the Mankato area. We haven't been to uh, Duluth, as far as I can recall. I'm no, just trying to think of the bigger areas. Right. We haven't been to Duluth. We've talked about St. Paul. We haven't been to Alec, Owatonna. No. Um, we were just at Rochester. Mm -hmm. You know, um, yeah, there's a, yeah, let's dialogue about it and then I'll kind of, once we come up with some suggestions, maybe we could bounce them off the rest of the board. Yeah, I think that's good. And then maybe we can send that around in our doodle poll that will create us to the future board members. And just so you know, going forward, new board members, um, when we send out the doodle poll, we're going to try to that we're going to schedule the last three meetings because typically we like to know exactly when those meetings are every year so everybody can plan ahead um, and be where they need to be as far in advance as possible. This year was an exception. Um, but we are going to do that for the next for when we ask for location it'll be for the rest of the year it's not just for the next one um all right uh, any other questions or thoughts from anyone are the three meetings going to be in the same location no i think we're going to rotate we're going to move um and we'll we'll figure that out um we don't have a solution yet but the idea is to move them throughout the state um Excuse me, Jackie. Yes. Byron, <clears throat> Pat Lambert here. Uh, just kind of curious, would something like that be work out for the right away conference that MnDOT puts on? Oh my gosh, I completely forgot about the right away conference. Absolutely, that would be excellent for the right away conference. Let me see when it is, just a second here. I think it's the it's September. It's at the end of October, I believe. September 27th, it starts, I believe. It's September, I thought it was August. Oh yeah. Um, no, there we go. That's actually a really good idea. I do. I do know that Commerce will be presenting at that conference as well. They we were asked to present. Yes. Um, Where is it? It's Rainer. Rainer. Oh, it's Breezy Point. Yep. Great. Yep. Um, so that's a good I, idea. Think, I think we've just picked our third quarter spot, haven't we? Yeah, I was going to say that was the third <laughs> quarter. That would make sense for the third quarter. So that would be. Breezy. Yeah, August or September, whatever that date is, and then so we just yep. need the, tw the 27th through the 29th. That's right. Okay, that's a good idea. Okay. Beautiful. And then I'll look at some other stuff. Uh, I was talking to Brett Hall just the other day, and I think Christy Mackerman's on the line here too. So um, they, it, it's noted. Okay. That's All right. A great, great suggestion. All right. So we'll. Um, Byron, you and I can connect, and then we'll get that sent out to the board members so we can establish the rest of the meetings for the year. Okay. Where they um, all right. Well, if there is no other comments or questions or anything noted, um, we can adjourn. Um, so thank you all for everybody, all the public members who've called in to listen. Um, and thank you for everybody who was able to be here in person as well. Thank you. All right. So at this point, right, do we have a motion to adjourn? Oh, sorry. Yes, thank so you, moved. Byron. <laughs> the chair. So moved. Do I have a second? Second. Okay. okay. All right. Very good. All right. Thank you, everyone. Meetings adjourned. Thank you. Bye now.